Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on gender and education, today we are conducting fourth session on uh, women education in colonial India. Under this, today we are going to talk on attitude of uh, nationalists towards female education as well as we would be discussing on uh, regional progress of uh, female education in colonial India. And for this discussion, we have with us in our studios the most dynamic uh, professor in the studio. We have with us uh, Dr. Shruti Bib. Dr. Shruti Bib is Assistant Professor in Department of History, PGDAV Evening College, University of Delhi. Dr. Bib has immense experience and she is contributing immensely in the area of academics. Friends, if you want to ask questions from Dr. Bib on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. All friends are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture for easy delivery of the lecture as well as to have a deep insight into today's session. Friends, be promised to give answers to your questions in the last 10 minutes through Dr. Shruti Bhai. So, we would like to welcome once again our guest, Dr. Shruti Bhai. Dr. Bhai, welcome to the lecture. Hello, Geetika, and thanks a lot for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, and welcome back, viewers. Uh, so, we were discussing uh, the contours of uh, female education during colonial India. And today also, I would be talking on the similar theme. Uh, so, basically, uh, what we have covered so far is not only, uh, you know, periodization as to when uh, the progress towards education and educational reform started, but also uh, specifically what were the changes that came about in uh, the field of uh, women's education from time to time, starting from the last half of 19th century. So, carrying on from where I had left, we would be t uh, basically talking about uh, the changes that started coming about from the mid 19th century and it is in this context that in the last lecture also I had uh, made reference to a very important change that had come about and that was the Woods Dispatch uh, and uh, 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 after this Woods Dispatch it was not only the attitude of the government uh, towards the cause of female education which started changing. But also there was change in the mindsets of Indians as well uh, and uh, so therefore there began, be, uh, began a positive change towards this whole idea of imparting uh, some kind of education, training, uh, even though it was uh, specifically belonging to a separate kind of a curriculum to the women. Uh, now, the w Woods Dispatch of 1854 also recognized the importance of Zenana form of education, that is, the education that was imparted to females uh, within the four walls of their homes and that too by specific teachers who had some kind of training in imparting Zenana kind of education. So, uh, uh, Woods Dispatch recognized that in a society like India, which was uh, largely orthodox by their standards and women were not really allowed to uh, roam around freely or to participate in, uh, you know, a more universal kind of an education or co-educational institutions. So, in order to uh, encourage any kind of literacy among women, it was imperative to consider the ground reality and not only to superimpose their kind of educational uh, reforms or systems universally. So, therefore, uh, they for the first time recognized the importance and value of Zenana education and also uh, the fact that they needed more trained uh, teachers who would be ready to visit the homes of these girls and impart some kind of training to them. And this also meant a specific reference to uh, formal education and formal training that was now to be specifically targeted for the girl students. So, both uh, the options were considered as important and work uh, definitely started in this direction. Now, while on the one hand there was the government who was taking keen interest in uh, pushing forward these kind of educational reforms uh, and on the other hand there were very important indigenous efforts also that were being made and this development was also going on parallelly. 
So, uh, when I say indigenous efforts, it basically means the efforts made by educated Indians, philanthropists, the social reformers, who from time to time took up the cause of not only social reforms, but also how to spread education and literacy among Indian women. Now, uh, uh, the, the, the very fact that this realization came at a time when English education was also spreading and a new kind of secular education had also made inroads uh, into India is uh, also an important factor worth considering. And uh, Jyoti Rao Phule along with his wife Savitri Bai Phule opened the first school for girls in Pune in 1848 which was a very important achievement for those times. And uh, similarly the Brahmo Samaj in Bengal had set up an organization for women to learn and share religious instructions, household skills and social issues in 1865. And in fact, much earlier than this, uh, in 1830s and 1840s, Brahmo Samaj had started championing the cause of women education, about which we ha I have already discussed in detail important developments that had taken place in Bengal and particularly with reference to Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar. So, I am not going to repeat all those indigenous efforts that were made by the Indian reformers today, but the students uh, and viewers are ex um, requested to uh, go back and uh, kind of have uh, some uh, knowledge about all the changes that I had discussed, particularly with reference to Bengal and Maharashtra. Now, uh, in order to make Zenana education uh, more uh, efficient and more influential, uh, in 1862, uh, some training centers were also opened uh, and where female teachers were to be imparted specific kind of training uh, and these centers were set up in Bombay, Pune and Ahmedabad by Mary Carpenter. So, uh, here again I would refer to some of my previous lectures where I have in detail discussed the role played by some English women, some educated European ladies who had taken up the cause of female education in India and though this was not devoid of racial implications but then yes there were some important contributions that were made by them and teacher training institutions were one such contributions uh, one, uh, one such important development that had been started by uh, Mary Carpenter and in this she was also patronized by the British administrators. Now uh, a normal school in Calcutta developed in 1872 with Keshap Sen and Anit Ackroyd, uh, which again was a very important development. Now, uh, uh, the, oh, a reference must be made here to the important contribution made by the Hunter Commission uh, in 1882. So, uh, the most important development uh, post-1882 was the differentiation of curriculum and the aspect of the utility of education, uh, the principle that was now added to the whole uh, you know, uh, idea of educational reform as to whether the kind of education that was being imparted was of any use to pupils or not. Then also uh, Hunter Commission supported the idea of diversification of the curriculum into two parts. One was to prepare the student for further study and the other was to uh, enable them to perform their everyday life functions in a better way. Then uh, it was Hunter Commission which recommended an immediate arrangement of public funds for more schooling of girls and also specifically appointment of lady teachers, inspectresses, uh, also a separate curriculum for girls. Then also the, uh, the fact that there was a need for special hostels for girls and special specific arrangements for higher education, these also were some specific issues that were taken up by Hunter Commission. So basically Hunter Commission after Wood's dispatch was a major policy document and 
uh, it was uh, you know a major a breakthrough as far as female education was concerned because not only uh, uh, the issue was taken up uh, far more seriously but also there was a negative implication of uh, uh, the kind of interest that uh, Britishers were, were now generating in the cause of female education and that was the realization that uh, Indian women needed separate curriculum and this uh, very realization was going to uh, do more harm rather than uh, benefit to the cause of female education because for a long time certain attitudes were formed and there was hardening of those attitudes over a period of time that there was no need for female students to learn subjects like arithmetic, science you know, uh, and other such uh, professional courses or medicine because ultimately they had to take care of the family and the and home so therefore home science nutrition based subjects and such uh, feminine so called feminine subjects uh, came to be uh, devised as the core uh, of a separate curriculum which was now becoming more and more popular as an idea after 1882 uh, the theosophical society in madras uh, also promoted the cause of female education and uh, uh, any uh, besant who was the president of the society not only condemned child marriage, widowhood, custom of sati but she was also specifically interested in the cause of female education. In fact, she went on to establish the Central Hindu College for Boys in 1898 which now caters to both girls as well as boys. Then another important development that one can talk of uh, as far as Western India was concerned, one can talk about or Northern India is concerned, one can talk about the region uh, around Punjab where the Jalandhar Samaj established an elementary school uh, in 1890 and a high school in 1892 was set up in Punjab uh, for girls. Then the Hunter Commission's report of 1882 further emphasized female education and promoted Zenana system in school for secular education of women who otherwise were largely confined in the religious boundaries of home. Now another interesting fact that emerged after 1882 was the realization that what Britishers needed to set up in India was not Christian missionary schools only because many parents were not sending their girl children to these schools for the fear of conversion and therefore uh, now there was an insistence on secular kind of education where religion would not be the deciding factor or uh, uh, religious conversation, uh, conversion would not be the prime motive of uh, inducting more and more students in such schools. Now uh, coming to the span from 1882 to 1947. Uh, if one uh, looks minutely at uh, the progress of girls' education, one uh, can conclude uh, that the progress had started but it was slow, though it was steady, but it was quite slow. And enrollment in women's schools and colleges grew from 1.27 lakhs in 1882 to 3.93 lakhs in 1902, according to the figures generated by Ministry of Education. Then, uh, so therefore, one can uh, say that people began to realize the importance of education of girls at least up to primary level. And the number of girls in universities also increased from 6 merely 6 in 1881-82 to 264 by the end of 19th century. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, uh, the data uh, that has been provided by Geraldine Forbes uh, in her work in 2012. So uh, these figures definitely point out to the trend of a very slow but some steady progress taking place uh, and uh, specifically if we talk about the period from 1902 to 1920s then we realize that it was not only the colonial administration particularly with reference to Lord Curzon who was uh, keenly interested in the cause of female education but also uh, uh, the national movement that had taken off in 
in a big way uh, and particularly post 1885 with the establishment of Indian National Congress, uh, the cause of education of Indians had become very important and particularly from the first uh, a decade or so of uh, 20th century, this realization was all the more. And after coming in of Mahatma Gandhi on the political scene and post, uh, you know, uh, 1919, with the mobilization of masses and with the large scale participation of females in uh, most of the movements that were started by Mahatma Gandhi, there was definitely, uh, you know, a, a uh, a, a call beyond home and uh, this uh, participation in the public sphere went a long way in also opening the doors of various institutions, educational institutions, social institutions to women. Now, uh, Lord Curzon uh, was uh, an ardent supporter of the cause of women's education and this support was reaffirmed with the government resolution on education policy that came up in 1913. The resolution of 1913 recommended that the education of girls should be more practical uh, with reference to the position that they fill in the social life. So, the educationists now felt the urgent need of the revision in the curriculum in girls' schools. So therefore, uh, uh, the issue of curriculum continued as it is, that there was a realization that separate curriculum was the need of the hour so that the females can become more responsible uh, parts of families and they could perform their domestic functions uh, in a far better uh, uh, hygienic, responsible, time-bound, disciplined manner because ultimately they were going to be the backbone of the family and they were the ones who were going to, uh, you know, provide a conducive atmosphere so that the men in the family could provide dutiful and obedient service to the British Raj and they could adhere to the clock time and they could uh, adhere to, you know, the... Uh, Nokri, which was again a very uh, alien kind of a concept for Indian men, most of whom belong to Zamidari families. So therefore, it was considered that if uh, Indian men or if Indian families had to become modern, then their wives and their mothers must be educated, they must be diligent in performing their wifely and motherly duties so that men could be, uh, uh, you know, more carefree and they could be more responsible and they would be performing their duties in a far more, uh, in a better way and uh, with greater responsibility and commitment towards the British regime. So therefore, there was a distinct feeling uh, 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 of, uh, now, uh, yeah, so another very important aspect that needs to be discussed here is that with this kind of uh, keen interest that was being generated uh, uh, for the cause of female education, what was the Indian reaction as to what was the reaction of educated Indians or what was the reaction of Indian nationalists towards uh, this new kind kind of development that was that had been going on for several decades so uh, if one talks about indian reaction there was a distinct feeling of dissatisfaction with the curriculum of sco schools and colleges uh, because most of this curriculum was de uh, designed by keeping in mind the needs and requirements of boys uh, and uh, no specific attention according to Indian reformers and nationalists was paid to the requirements of Indian girls. So this was a constant complaint that Indian nationalists carried and uh, uh, this was one of the reasons that they were so critical because though Hunter Commission had recognized the importance of separate curriculum, still uh, 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 till uh, middle school or even till uh, secondary education, uh, curriculum had not completely been uh, segregated. So therefore, therefore, there were some common subjects that were being taught. And uh, it was uh, since there was the uh, issue of uh, child marriage and most of the girls would end up getting married by the age of 12 or 13 years. So therefore, they never got access to uh, studying the separate kind of specific curriculum that would 
would make them more uh, aware of their wifely and motherly duties. So therefore, Indian nationalists had this constant complaint that why Indian girls were being exposed to English education unnecessarily uh, and to professional uh, kind of uh, skill related subjects when they were not really going to make any use of it. So uh, uh, this drawback uh, led Professor D. K. Carve to establish the Indian Women's University in Pune in 1916 with the special aim of providing an educational system suited to the special needs of Indian womanhood. And uh, therefore, this Indian initiative that came uh, had specific patriarchal implications. Uh, Srimati Nathibai Damodar Thakarse Women's University, that is uh, SNDT Women's University was established in 1916 in Bombay with the objective of higher education of women through local languages that is vernacular languages to formulate courses of studies specifically suited to the needs and requirements of the female students. And similarly in Madras, the secondary school leaving scheme provided a wide choice of subjects like music, needlework, domestic economy and physiology. So therefore, new schools, new courses were devised from time to time. For example, in Bombay also, home craft became a compulsory subject for girls, particularly at the level from the level of upper primary. Uh, and in some of the elementary schools of Gujarat and Maharashtra, specific instruction was given in hygiene, first aid, cooking, household management, sewing, laundry and gardening. Uh, a course of physical education was organized for teachers of girls secondary schools near Bombay and the Young Women's Christian Association that is YWCA lent the services of a certified athletic mistress. So therefore, a specific kind of training and uh, subjects were being encouraged regionally and uh, then there was no looking back. Uh, 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 as far as the cause of separate curriculum was concerned. Uh, now, Indian nationalism and women's education, both these can also be, uh, uh, you know, uh, seen as uh, in a symbiotic kind of a relationship. As I have just mentioned that how with the uh, participation, with the larger participation of women in the public sphere, uh, there was uh, then an opening of space and a lesser hardening of stance towards the idea of freedom of women. And by the first quarter of 20th century, the issue of education was influenced by Indian nationalism and particularly from 1919 onwards due to the large scale participation in Gandhian mass movements. And uh, it was this was also the time when Indianization of education was also being demanded by nationalists. People did not want their daughters to be taught the topics that were taught in the West. They were okay if their boys were taught those topics or if they were taught in English. But they had problems if their uh, girl children would be taught uh, these alien uh, subjects in alien language. So Indian social reformers and political leaders started demanding emphatically a new curriculum for Indian girls as the curriculum already in use for Indian boys was found to be inadequate because the main aim uh, uh, of education according to nationalists was to purify the soul of Indian women to make them more suitable for domestic roles and this was just not possible with foreign kind of education in imp being imparted in English language. So the Indian educationists were of the opinion that the girls need to be trained not only to become efficient housewives but should also be acquainted with their culture and this culture could not be imparted in English language and that too by teaching uh, new kind of subjects that had been introduced by the new education system devised by the Britishers. So nationalists demanded that domestic science should be made compulsory for the girls and uh, uh, it was uh, 
but this demand was not completely adhered to and it was more or less uh, this subject continued as an optional subject. And also an option was given by the colonial administrators and by the educationists to girls in uh, the higher level of education to opt for uh, subjects which they wanted. So, it was not kind of a compulsion that uh, at higher level that is in college at the college level the uh, females would be studying only domestic science related subjects. So, that kind uh, of freedom and option was uh, uh, continued and some girls even exercised their option. Now, uh, uh, another important development that uh, uh, ought to be discussed is the 1919 resolution from the government of India education department. Uh, it pointed out that there was an improvement in the general position of Indian women and various organizations like the Pune Seva Sadhan had performed very good work in training women and girls as nurses, midwives, wives, assistant surgeons, teachers, art and craft workers. So, these professions specifically emerged as more feminine kind of professions and this was even recognized by the government resolutions. Then less than 60 percent of the girls and women who were under instruction in India were attending institutions intended exclusively for females and more than 40 percent were in co-ed institutions. So, this resolution also recognized the fact that the idea of co-ed institutions, the idea of uh, sending girls to co-ed educational institutions was slowly gaining ground though the first preference of Indian parents was still to have specific kind of education and that too uh, only girl uh, students. Uh, schools. There were high schools and middle schools, both English as well as vernacular for girls. Then there were also training uh, colleges and schools for mistresses, that is uh, uh, specifically train, uh, teacher training institutions as well as medical schools for female students. And all this was taken note of by this government resolution of 1919 which provides very valuable data uh, as far as enrollment and uh, output pattern of education is concerned. Uh, now, uh, in the course of uh, this discussion and uh, the very fact that female education had taken off and it was becoming more and more popular, it is very imperative that we also discuss what were the peculiar uh, difficulties that uh, the administrators were encountering or uh, the, the difficulties which the female students were encount encountering in the institutions. So, in the next course of the lecture, I would be talking about that. Thank you. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us a session uh, on women education once again. And uh, friends, we would be coming back after a short break. So, be with us.
Hello friends, welcome back to this session where we are discussing on women education in colonial India. In this half, we would be discussing on what were the uh, difficulties uh, faced uh, in the path of the women education as well as we would be discussing on a regional variation and the question of curriculum. And uh, to give answers to the question and to explain the topics in detail, we have with us in our studios Dr. Shruti Vip. Friends, if you want to ask questions from Dr. Shruti Vip on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. So I would like to request Dr. Shruti Vip to continue further and uh, kindly explain us in detail. Welcome Thanks, back. Thanks, Kritika. So welcome back viewers, uh, we were discussing peculiar difficulties that were faced in the path of female education during colonial period. Uh, as uh, we, I have already discussed uh, this in uh, some of my earlier lectures, so I would just be making a pass passing reference to this so that you are able to understand the connections. So one important aspect that needs to be taken care of is the rigidities in customs and the patriarchal uh, social setup. So, uh, for a, a detailed reference to uh, this point, you kindly refer to some of my earlier lectures which have been discussed in the previous series. Then one also needs to talk about the system of early marriage and the rigid seclusion of women which uh, de deprived uh, most of the women from going to any kind of schools or Im getting imparted uh, any kind of education even at home because they ended up getting married by the age of 9 or 10 years. Then the lack of trained female teachers and uh, the unsuitability, the so called unsuitability of the curriculum uh, was also one of the important factor and uh, this also kind of hindered parents from uh, supporting the cause of female education because they thought that uh, sending girls to uh, co-ed educational institutions or to those institutions where there was no specific kind of female related curriculum was of no use because ultimately all the education that would be imparted would uh, go waste or it would only spoil these girls and uh, make them immoral or uh, you know uh, n uh, would not really bring any positive uh, value addition to their character. So therefore, with this kind of a very rigid mindset, uh, the problem of uh, a very slow uh, progress in the cause of female education was a reality. Now, uh, we can also discuss some of the accounts, uh, uh, the contemporary accounts of female inspectresses. Uh, who used to visit the schools uh, and they used to monitor the progress and the achievement of the students. So one such account that I would like to share with you is that of Miss Ashworth who was an inspectress in Bombay and she wrote that at present with few exceptions the schools followed the same course as the boys schools. And therefore, uh, this course was not very popular because it was considered as harmful and it, it was also uh, uh, the parents used to think that such kind of educational course would make girls weak and would also deprive them of their own cultural values. So therefore, uh, due to these uh, inhibitions, what resulted in was even if some girls ended up coming to the schools without any uh, physical and moral support from their parents, they would end up cramming and they would end up cramming without understanding and therefore whatever was being taught remained beyond their comprehension. So this was one of the uh, eyewitnesses account of one of the school inspectresses. Then another account can be taken from a report by Mr. Converton uh, who remarked that taken as a whole the girl readers are simpler in general treatment and narrower in the range of subjects than the boys. The wider topics of history, literature and science are of little concern to vernacular girls for whom biographies illustrating the good deeds of great and virtuous women, accounts of their native land and its most distinguished sons are considered as 
ethical. So therefore, uh, even the colonial administrators and ed educationists could make out that how uh, uh, girls were being deprived of a more general and a secular kind of education and what they valued or their parents valued more was uh, some kind of an, uh, uh, you know, moral stories or eulogizing the, uh, the female, uh, uh, you know, uh, leaders or uh, even male leaders for that matter. So therefore, uh, the virtuous women like Sita, Savitri uh, and uh, such virtuous women's related stories, fables, etc. were considered as far more valuable uh, theme of education rather than a more secular or a professional oriented kind of education. Then there was the problem of specific subjects. The problem that had become more pertinent now because of the objections that were being raised by Indian nationalists that Indian girls need not be unnecessarily exposed to foreign kind of education. So therefore, stories and lessons inculcating modesty and sobriety of conduct and demeanor together with the poems of a moral and natural religious characteristic were held by the native public opinion to be far more useful and uh, preferable. So, uh, they also included lessons on elementary physiology, nothing in detail and also some kind of hygiene and uh, these subjects were far more popular rather than uh, more hardcore subjects like history or geography or arithmetics. Uh, in Medros, lower secondary middle course, the compulsory subjects for boys and girls were the same, but the optional subjects for girls included needlework and domestic economy for girls. So therefore, so, uh, this kind of segregation had started developing and in, in fact with the progress of female education this hardening of binaries between feminine subjects and masculine subjects uh, rather increased over a period of time. Then uh, if one talks about regional variations that very much existed in the cause of female education. Then in Bombay, what we see is that in the middle stage, girls could substitute any portion of science for domestic economy, that is subjects related to domesticity. In Bengal, in the regulations for vernacular schools, needlework for girls replaced agriculture or science and geometry for boys. So therefore, there was a clear-cut demarcation uh, in Bengal, even in vernacular schools. And uh, the demarcation was such that science and geometry as well as agriculture were uh, described exclusively as uh, subjects related to boys. Then the manual training could be substituted for needlework in mixed schools, which had no facilities for teaching needle schools, uh, needlework. So even those schools where there was no facility for teaching needlework, even in those schools, girls were given this option for opting needlework so that their parents do not withdraw them from schools in the fear that their girls were not being taught domesticity, they were not being trained as, you know, uh, perfect uh, uh, housewives. Uh, a separate course was in fact laid down for vernacular middle schools for girls in Punjab which contained lesser arithmetic. So therefore, right from the beginning this phobia was being inculcated among girls that probably you need different kind of subjects because you would not be doing well in mathematics and science. And uh, the schools would rather mellow down their uh, uh, curriculum and they would in fact uh, uh, make essential changes in their uh, curriculum, in their subjects, in their coursework, keeping in mind the specific requirements of the girl students. Uh, so basically, the idea was to create a Sughar BV. So Sughar BV, in fact, was a very important subject in some of the schools. And such schools uh, would also become very popular among the local population. So uh, it became a very popular subject in the middle schools, not only in uh, the vernacular uh, language schools, but also in some of the private schools that were started by Indian philanthropists. So in Delhi, home economy was taught 
in the two aided middle schools for Christian girls at Delhi uh, and the Percy Noble Institute for Women near Madura trained girls in house management, cooking, health and sanitation, household accounts and gardening. Again, specific kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, domesticity uh, related subjects uh, and uh, uh, with special reference to a deep grounding in culture, ethics and values. In Anglo vernacular schools, the optional subjects included hygiene, domestic economy, needlework, dressmaking, drawing, singing, music, cookery and weaving. Again, all those subjects that were specifically designed keeping in mind the options for the girls. Uh, in Assam, music, painting, sewing, nursing and cooking, they received special prominence in most of the girls' schools and the number of pupils who appeared for the needlework diploma examination rather increased from 587 in 1921 to 919 in 1926. Now, what is the idea that uh, uh, is generated from such data? That instead of progressing in secular kind of education or instead of, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking recourse to modern subjects and modern kind of education, women were now increasingly being relegated to these kind of subjects uh, and with specific intention of grooming them into well-turned-out ladies, you know, uh, what they used to describe as Sughar Bivi. And uh, this whole uh, problem, rather than uh, getting eradicated, uh, in fact, it, it, it became uh, all the more uh, 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 well established in the mindsets of not only Indians, but even colonial administrators started offering such subjects in their own uh, Anglo vernacular schools. Now, uh, another very important issue that was related to this uh, issue, the, uh, the problematic of female education was the question of suitability of curriculum. Uh, Ms. M. A. Shab, uh, Lady Superintendent of Mahalakshmi Training College, Ahmedabad, said that variations in the curriculum may be sanctioned by the local educational authority. So, therefore, uh, uh, this was considered as uh, uh, not only, uh, you know, something that was uh, possible, but also it was uh, to be done legally and uh, the, the local uh, administration was also hand in glove with this kind of development. Uh, M. E. Shab wanted the education of girls to be suitable to the local requirement. Uh, education was to uh, be such that they could become more fit for their home duties uh, like cooking and also uh, uh, with this kind of mindset, she was of the opinion that more and more girls would be sent to schools. But the question that arises here is that even if girls were going to schools and they were not given the kind of normal universal education, then what was the use of that kind of education, which was not only uh, making them uh, 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 rigid in their mindset, but also kind of uh, promoting specific kind of rigid, rigid kind of uh, subject choice. Uh, then Miss A. E. Brooke, uh, another inspectress of girls schools in Sindh observed that boys under 9 years of age may be admitted to girls schools because it was considered that uh, before the 9 years of age the subjects uh, can still be the same and therefore in those areas where there was a paucity of co-educational institutions then this opportunity must be given to the boys that they be sent to the girls schools. In the higher primary schools there was a growing demand for more practical education which could only be given by teachers who were specifically trained in home craft. So, therefore, soon educational institutions and training institutions started where now teachers also were specifically to be trained in home crafts so that they would become good teachers to these girl students and impart them the best possible education related to domesticity. Now, uh, coming to the issue of female education in Bengal, here I would like to make a passing reference to, uh, uh, you know, a short story written by Rabindranath Tagore, uh, The Exercise Book. 
uh, this uh, in this story uh, tagore has uh, written about a, a young girl uh, uma who got married at the age of 9 and uh, sh- this story brings out the reality of the orthodox family in bengal uh, that how she got al- along her uh, notebook uh, as part of her dowry and uh, in but though she got it along she had to hide her uh, will to get education from the other women in her husband's family as it was considered uh, highly offensive and objectionable and when these females came to know about the secret wish of uma they not only uh, ridiculed her but they uh, told everything to the husband uh, and all these complaints resulted in a backlash from the husband uh, and he not only ridiculed uma but also tore her book into pieces so therefore uh, with this kind of uh, story the idea that rabindranath tagore was generating was to bring to the fore the the orthodoxy that was uh, implicit in uh, any uh, you know ordinary kind of bengali family and similar uh, implications were also there not only in bengal but in other areas of uh, indian subcontinent also in 1882 Uh, however uh, besides th- this kind of an attitude even in bengal there were few exceptions so uh, talking about such exceptions one can uh, discuss that how in 1882 uh, chandramukhi basu and kadambini ganguli both of them passed the examination of the bachelor's degree in arts from university of calcutta in india their formal degrees were handed during the convocation of the university in 1883 in fact these were not only the first two women graduates in india but in the entire british empire and the british empire as you must be knowing also included united kingdom so therefore it was the two indian women uh, coming from bengal who became the first graduates and they got their degrees in 1883 so therefore uh, you can see the paradoxical situation that was prevalent in bengal that on the one hand we have these women who who had graduated uh, for the first time uh, not only in india but in the entire british empire on the other hand there was a 9 year old uma who was not able to continue her study due to child marriage and even in her husband's home she could not continue reading or writing because of the scolding and the backlash that she got uh, the first woman graduate from the bombay university was cornelia sorabji in 1888 again i have discussed in great detail about her achievements in uh, in the last series so i would uh, request those interested to revert back to that lecture now a uh, university college london was the first to admit female students on the same grounds as men in 1878 so as late as 1878 uh, a free and independent country like uh, uk uh, uh, was uh, you know it uh, started this practice and while the first female graduate emerged from the university of wales in 1896 much later than it happened in india so this was definitely a great achievement for calcutta university and also for indian femininity now another uh, important development was that of chandramukhi bose chandramukhi bose was a bengali christian who was born in dehradun in 1860 and in 1876 due to the discriminatory official stance towards gender she had to be given special permission to appear for the examination in which she stood first along with kadambini ganguli she moved to bethune school for the degree course and after her graduation in fact she was the first woman to pass ma from the university of calcutta in 1884 so here again there was a great achievement that uh, there was an uh, uh, was a female who passed ma in 1884 and that too in colonial india uh, her two sisters bidumukhi and bindu bhasini they were also earliest graduates of the calcutta medical college 
1890 and 1891 respectively. Chandramukhi Bose became the first female principal of Bethune College in 1888 uh, before retiring in 1901 due to illness. So therefore, uh, there was a, a slow and a steady uh, progress not only towards primary and secondary education but also higher education and also medical education. Uh, but while all this progress was going on, Another problem that continued to persist was schooling amidst proselytization, that is conversion. English men and women, though they started a number of educational institutions in India, uh, various Christian missionary schools and colleges, uh, but most of these institutions had proselytization tendencies, that is their aim was to convert convert the native population into Christianity and due to this uh, there was a lot of inhibition among Indian parents who stopped sending their girl students to the schools set up by uh, these English men and women. So, uh, it was in this background that a very uh, a welcome development took place and that was uh, a lawyer named John Drinkwater Bethune established possibly the first and the most influential school for women's education in Calcutta in 1849 which was secular as well. So therefore this was not affiliated to any church and there was no uh, conversion activity that was uh, on its agenda and this school soon became very popular uh, among the local population. Then uh, uh, but still with the influx of such educational institutions, not only schools but also colleges, there was even greater resistance from the native population, from the native philanthropists as well as from Indian men. So here I would like to give reference to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a writer, uh, uh, in fact a noted Bengali poet uh, of the time named Ishwar Chandra Gupta who wrote a poem in which he remarked, All our lassies smacking their fingers and books in their hands will spiral down to infamy with knowledge of A, B and dressed like Mem Sahibs and surely muttering in their foreign lingo. So, from this poem you can just uh, imagine the kind of doubts and uh, hostility that Indian men carried in their minds towards such educated females that they would you know just be carrying books in their hand, there would be nothing else in their hand. So, basically the idea was that they would now be neglecting their household course and also they would be uh, adopting all the mannerisms of a Mem Sahib. So, they would uh, be completely devoid of their own uh, Indian traditional ethnic culture, values and idioms and they would only be aping what English women uh, do and this Mame Sahib kind of character was surely going to rob them of all the good goodness that was left in them. But despite such opposition and despite such satirical uh, poems and cartoons that kept on coming from time to time, there was no looking back and there was a, a great influence of Brahmo families to the cause of female education. Uh, by eight, in 1888, Bethune School of, uh, the Bethune School of 136 students had 87 Brahmos out of which 44 Hindus and 5 Christians. So basically it was Brahmos who were in majority. They were kind of able to convince their families about the importance and utility of the uh, cause of female education. And Bethune School which was started in 1979, uh, in sorry in 1849 with only Kadambini Bose as single student soon became very popular in due course of time. Uh, there was also a burst of publications of Bengali periodicals like Prabashi and Bhara Barsha. 
which contributed greatly to the enrichment of the Bengali women's minds, their values, their ideas about education. And uh, soon these uh, periodicals, they became so popular that uh, they became regulars at most of the uh, Bhadralok households. Uh, they could read them, however, in the confines of their Shoshur Baris. Uh, which were uh, which were not really uh, very supportive of uh, uh, women going into their rooms and sitting silently and just reading these periodicals. So therefore, they had to do all, uh, all this reading in a very hidden and a clandestine manner. Uh, then, uh, equally important uh, is the contribution of Kadambini Ganguly Nibos to the cause of female education. Uh, we would be discussing this in greater detail in uh, the future lecture. So, for the time being, I would take a break. Thanks a lot. We would like to thank uh, Dr. Shruti for giving us a productive session on women education in India. And dear friends, we believe that you might have learnt a lot from today's session. So, if you have any queries or if you want to give your feedback for this particular lecture, then do write to us at info.cec at as well as you can ask questions from our previous sessions also as we have all the sessions uploaded on YouTube. You can look all the lectures and afterwards if you feel so that you have some questions, then of course you can write to us at info.cbc at nic.in. And yes, all the lectures on YouTube can be viewed on www. Uh, youtube.com slash cec edusat this is our youtube channel where you can see all the lectures on different subjects so friends your feedbacks are very very essential for us keep watching us keep writing us we would meet again very soon and would be discussing more on gender and education till then take care goodbye thank you ma'am thank you once again thanks a lot Geetika.